-hmm. you can actually reset not just the apparent age of the animal, but the biological age, their functional age. So when we do that in the eye of the mouse, we, we deliver a set of three genes and we turn them on and we don't just see the clock go back, we also see that the mice get their vision back. They can see again. Wow. And those nerves are young again. They don't just look young, they are literally young. If we can restore vision in old mice, what else can we reverse? Wow. Do you want to know what it is? Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body, Mind, Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Seem Lanz, and our guest today is Dr. David Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair is a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School. He's one of the world's leading researchers in aging, longevity, and life extension. Dr. Sinclair, welcome to the show. Hi, Sam. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, uh, it's uh, great to have you on the show, and uh, <laughs> I've been looking at your uh, research and uh, scientific accomplishments online for quite a while, and it's great to kind of meet face to face as close as, as is possible. Yeah, it's great to be on. Thanks. All right. Uh, you've been doing, you know, research, you've been researching aging for uh, quite a while now. Uh, what got you into this uh, field of research in the first place? Uh, well, the first memory I have of thinking about aging uh, is when I was four years old. Most of us at four realized that aging will happen and our parents will die, our pets will die. So that, that was troubling. I didn't get serious about it until the end of high school. And then I went to college to get a degree in genetics uh, to tackle what I think is the most important problem that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, if we solve this problem, if people can live an extra 10, 20, 30 years longer without getting sick, then that's trillions of dollars we can use to do other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, so, it's so true in the sense that uh, people, as they get older, then they're also their productivity and uh, happiness tends to decline in some aspects as well. They become like less functional. And it's kind of a unique perspective of looking at, okay, if we fix the aging problem or uh, alleviate the negative side effects of it, then you know, we don't even have to try to fix the symptoms of everything else that aging causes. <laughs> exactly. In the future, when this all comes true, and uh, it's not that far away, People will look back at today and say, can you believe they were trying to cure diseases after they happened, after mm. it was too late? Uh, this is a different approach about not just understanding why we fall off a cliff and die, but what gets us to that cliff in the first place. Yeah, that's true. You write about it quite extensively in your new book, uh, Lifespan. And uh, you also give like an amazing overview about all these theories and uh, and uh, ideas about why we age in the first place so maybe can you give us like uh, what's the can kind of over overview about like what's the current state of research in uh, anti-aging yeah sure well we've gone through phases every 10 years there's a new phase and we're just about to enter a new one uh, in the early 2000s uh, we were excited about longevity genes controlling our body's survival uh, and connecting that to dieting and exercise um, and we, you know, we can talk about that later. There's a lot in my book about why exercising and fasting is good for you. Uh, but in the last few years, there's been a real breakthrough in understanding um, the fundamental reasons that cause aging. And we've declared that there are about eight hallmarks of aging, things that go wrong in our body that need to be fixed if we're going to live a lot longer. And uh, I won't go through all eight, but uh, your listeners, your viewers may have heard of some of these, telomere shortening, mitochondrial right. dysfunction, uh, senescent or zombie cells uh, accumulating in the body. Uh, but what I've always been fascinated with is whether there's a single unified reason we age, not just having eight tributaries or rivers, but is there a, a major upstream river that if we block that, all of these other things don't occur? Mm -hmm. Or if we cause that to happen quickly, do these other hallmarks happen more quickly? And I propose what's called the information theory of aging. And that is that we lose what's called epigenetic information, and that leads to all of these other hallmarks of aging. And if we can slow that down or speed it up, then the other hallmarks should either slow down or get speeded up as well. And that's what we're finding in my lab and as I describe in my book. Mm. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, it's a very uh, interesting uh, idea. So can you like talk about more of this epi epigenetic theory of aging? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I could talk all day about it. Um, yeah. 
so there are two types of information in the body that keep us alive. Um, without either of them, we'd be dead in a second. Uh, the first we know about, uh, most people know about, DNA, the genetic material. This is digital information, uh, similar to uh, when we used to have uh, DVDs, it would be the music that was on the DVD. Uh, but then there's a second type of information that's just as important for our lives. That's the epigenome, which is the machines and structures in the cell that hold the DNA in, in certain uh, loops and packages that tell the cell what they should be and what they should stay. So okay. epigenetics is what keeps a cell a nerve cell and not a skin cell and what keeps a liver cell not turning into a, uh, a, 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 a kidney cell or, or a cancer cell. Mm -hmm. And what people haven't thought about is what happens to that information over time. Uh, and, but more recently, a number of labs have realized that the loss of epigenetic information how cells read the DNA is just as important, possibly more important for aging than the genome itself. And in fact, we've realized that your longevity and your health in old age is only 20% genetically determined and 80% mm. is epigenetic, which can be modified by how you live your life. Mm. That's, that's quite phenomenal, yeah. And it comes to show that you don't have to necessarily age like the vast majority of people do. Like usually you, your close family and relatives tend to really show accelerated signs of aging even after their 40s and 50s. So it comes to show that you can actually change it and control it to a certain extent. Right. So I started seriously testing things on, on myself, diet, exercise in my 20s. Mm -hmm. um, I started taking some molecules in my 30s. Um, I don't regret it. Some people ask me, when's the right time to start? You know, we are aging from, from conception, actually. We can now measure a biological clock in blood. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that aging doesn't 50. It starts when you're born or earlier. Um, right. So, I, you know, I'm not suggesting try dangerous medicines when you're a teenager. Not at all. But I am saying that living a healthy life that activates your longevity genes, make sure that your DVD in your cells doesn't get scratched. And so mm -hmm. the cells can read the genetic information late in life. Uh, that's what I do. I don't recommend anything. Everyone can live the life they want. And I don't want anyone to live longer than they want to. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to do is to give people information about how to live into their 80s, 90s and beyond in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And my body has been uh, a guinea pig for the last 30 years. <laughs> well, you're like 50, if I'm not mistaken, and you look great. So it must be working. <laughs> Well, I, I'm glad you think so. Um, <laughs> I don't have any gray hair. I, I still have some hair left. So it's at 50, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, I haven't aged physically in, uh, since I was 20. I mm. might actually be fitter than that. Actually, a, a really good example beyond me is my father, who's turned 80. Uh, mm. And he's stronger and fitter than I am, <laughs> enjoying life, started a new career. And that's, that doesn't really prove anything. You know, an, an experiment with two people doesn't prove something. Mm -hmm. placebo effect is pretty strong but our relatives haven't lived this long before they certainly haven't been this healthy um, so something might be going on here but if nothing else it's a beacon of hope for all of us for sure for sure and at least like your subjective quality of life is better <laughs> even though it may be not always uh, accurate or not what you think uh, exactly i hope to measure my biological age very accurately i haven't done that i've only done a few tests that estimate my age but based on those studies uh my body is much younger than my chronological age would suggest mm. right right uh so what are maybe some of the let's say uh, activities or things you can do to slow that slow down that aging process yeah so i've been doing a lot of it myself and i put a lot of research in my book uh more than i can talk about here so there's a lot in there chapter two is all about how to slow aging uh and why it why it works in part three, I talk about what I do. So the mm -hmm. things that I do uh, and have done for many years are uh, skip meals. Mm -hmm. uh, intermittent fasting is now fashionable, but I've been doing it for, for most of my life. <laughs> um, very rarely eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. These days, I might have a spoon of yogurt to dissolve uh, some of the, the molecules that I take, like resveratrol. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly, if the, my recommendation, if there's one thing I could say after all these years, uh, it's eat less often. Mm. Uh, we're, we're told by our parents, typically, or our teachers, don't be hungry, snack through the day, eat three meals. Uh, in my view, this is wrong. Um, mm. 
for kids at school, it's different. But once you're in college, you shouldn't be eating three full meals a day and snacking yeah. in between. Yeah. Uh, you want a period of hunger. Hunger is what gives your body the chance to fight back and turn on these longevity genes. Mm. The other things I do just very briefly, of course, more as in the book is to uh, not eat a lot of amino acids. I try to right. eat mostly plant based foods. I will eat meat. Meat's not toxic unless it's you know, smoked or heavily mm-hmm. cured, but fresh meat, cooked meat is all, is all good. Sushi without too much rice, this kind of stuff. I don't mind, mm. but mostly I try to eat vegetables also because I want to protect the planet as well. For sure. uh, I go to the gym. Doing high intensity training is important. You want to be out of breath. You want to run for at least 10 minutes uh, at the pace where you cannot carry out a conversation. You're breathing very deeply. This is very helpful. Hypoxia. Mm-hmm. Keep up your muscle strength. So I lift weights for about an hour. Uh, and then I go to the sauna and I jump in a cold, cold uh, pool to give my body a shock. Um, it's all about making sure your body doesn't become satisfied or complacent. Otherwise, right. it doesn't turn on these genes. Right, right, yeah, yeah. It's it's so true that uh, the, the the way you outlined in the book is also that um, your body is uh, surviving under these very harsh conditions where you're kind of forced to promote its own uh, longevity because yeah, otherwise it, it becomes kind of lazy and it doesn't have any reason to carry on the genome further. Uh, but yeah, the few of the things that you mentioned, like fasting, I'm a huge proponent of that as well, and I think actually think it's one of the most effective ways of turning on one of these uh, longevity genes, such as sirtuins and autophagy and so others. So uh, yeah, like I'm a huge proponent of fasting in some aspects and uh, even, even, yeah, like high intensity exercise, they kind of stimulate the similar pathways as fasting and uh, also turns on sirtuins and so on. So you've done like a lot of research about sirtuins in your lab. So uh, why do sirtuins help to promote longevity and how do they work? Yeah, so we discovered that longevity uh, is controlled in part by sirtuin. So we discovered this when I was at MIT in the lab of Lenny Garanti. And this is now going back 25 years. Uh, and these, these genes in yeast and, and in our bodies, they, they sense adversity. And what we discovered in my lab as about 1999, 2000, is that when a yeast cell is hungry, it will make more NAD. And NAD is a small molecule that sirtuins need to work. It's mm-hmm. the gas, the petrol for these mm-hmm. enzymes. And they go out and they protect the genome. Uh, they stabilize the epigenome so you don't get the, the scratches so quickly on, on your DVD in your cells. Um, and they repair broken DNA. They do lots of things. They control blood sugar, fat, um, cell survival. There's thousands of papers now on this topic. Yeast have five sirtuin genes. We have seven in our bodies. And those seven, think of them as guardians of the body that need to be activated by a bit of adversity, what we call hormesis. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that's largely because the sirtuins and the network of survival genes that they work with, other other genes are called ampikinase and mTOR. These form a, a protective network in our body. And you can activate them in certain ways that I describe more so in my book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, is is there other like any specific uh, compounds as well, or um, you know, dietary choices that uh, turn on certain ones? Yeah, r- good question. Um, so one of the things that's not very well known, um, even though we published it in a journal called Cell, which is well known, uh, is called xenohormesis, uh, starting with an X, X E N O, mm-hmm. hormesis. And this is the idea that when plants are stressed, they make molecules that help them survive because plants have sirtuins as well. Right. An example of a xenohermetic molecule is resveratrol, which you can find concentrated in red wine, which is made from stressed grapes and bottled. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so xenohermetic molecules can be found in all plants as long as they're stressed out. And so what I look for are plants that have not been treated very well, plants that have been picked when it's dry or really sunny or right. even with a fungal infection. And uh, you can tell that those foods are full of those molecules because xenohermetic molecules are colored usually, mm-hmm. um, or at least they, they associate with color. And so if you have food that's very dark green or red or purple, it's a good sign that they have those molecules in them. And so I look for those. I have a lot of salads if I can. Um, and that's one way I do it. 
There are other ways you can take concentrated forms of xenohermetic molecules. Like for resveratrol, I take, instead of drinking a thousand glasses of red wine a day, <laughs> just for, for breakfast, I have about a thousand milligrams or just a, a teaspoonful in, in my small mm. yogurt and mix it around. And right. that way I can have the equivalent of eating a lot of xenohermetic plants. And I think what's happening in my body is the body thinks that the food supply is, is drying up or disappearing and it gets ready for this adversity, even though it's right. not really happening. Right. Yeah, like, like the uh, plant polyphenols are an amazing example of this stress adaptation that makes the organism live longer. Like, like, like you said, uh, these uh, compounds, they accumulate in the plant if they're experiencing these environmental stressors such as sunlight or cold or something else. So uh, in a way, you're kind of sending your body the signal that, yeah, things are going, starting to go sour and that uh, the, uh, the winter is coming, basically, and you, you yourself would uh, benefit from like, strengthening itself and turning on these antioxidant defense systems and so on. So it's like a very interesting uh, and a per perfect example of how uh, humans like, evolved in the past, where they would, like, usually they wouldn't eat like, these berries if they had access to other, you know, nutrient dense foods, they would only eat those berries if they didn't have anything else to eat. And uh, exactly. they were, they were basically starving. And that's why like calorie restriction also like works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people say, well, what about carnivores that just eat meat? Well, there aren't many carnivores that just eat meat. Anyone who's exactly. had a pet dog or knows or a cat knows that they will also sample plants for their medicinal properties. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Um, what about the, like the, um, since the discovery of resveratrol, do you think that its effects or its uh, promise or potential has it stayed the same, or do you think that it's like somewhat de decreased as we now have like new research about these things? Uh, well, I'm still taking it, and it seems to be not hurting me. Uh, hopefully, helping. Uh, no, we've done a lot of research in my lab, and others have done clinical trials. Uh, we have some things that are are also helpful. Um, that I've added to my reg regimen. Uh, but resveratrol is still a very interesting molecule. Mm -hmm. uh, scientists like to debate things, right? So it got a lot of attention, then people had a backlash and tried to right. disprove things. But we have some, uh, some fairly recent results that we've published and some new ones that we haven't published that say that the lifespan extension we get in mice with resveratrol, mice that eat a Western diet, uh, is working through activating the sirtuins. Mm. Now, one way to think about, I mentioned NAD and I mentioned resveratrol. Mm -hmm. These act together in different ways. So think of it this way. There's a sirtuin enzyme that's protecting the cell and it needs to be activated. Now you can hunger, you can run um, and, or you can put your pedal to the metal. You can accelerate uh, and make the enzyme go really fast. That's resveratrol. Or you can give it more petrol or gas and that's NAD. Mm. And so the gas, the accelerator, the, the fasting um, and all these other things I do are all designed to keep my sirtuins always in a hyperactive state. Mm -hmm. And NAD is, is better in a sense than resveratrol um, or at least helps resveratrol because it activates all seven of the enzymes, not just number one. Right. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting that uh, it kind of mimics fasting to a certain extent or mimics exercise in some aspects of kind of tricking your body into thinking that it is exercising and it's activating these sirtuins. So you mentioned uh, NAD and uh, one, the area of research of NAD boosters and precursors is also pretty uh, interesting. So like what is NAD and uh, how does it affect uh, aging? Uh, the NAD, how does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so NAD is a molecule that we need for chemical reactions in the body, about 500 reactions. And Without it, we're, we're not going to live very long. And it became a very boring molecule in the 1990s. But when we discovered that sirtuins were important, uh, Lenny Garenti, my, my old lab across the river behind me, mm -hmm. uh, discovered that NAD is used by sirtuins. And it, what we then really figured out was that NAD levels go up and down during the day. When we are hungry, it goes up. Full goes down. When we sleep... Uh, it's going down, and when we go to wake up, it comes up. So it, it's essential, and it's changing through the day. Mm -hmm. And what we have realized is that as we get older, uh, many many of our tissues, our body um, tissues, goes down with NAD. So 
if I look at an old mouse, for example, it has very low NAD levels. And what we're finding in my lab and other labs is if you raise those NAD levels back up either to normal, young, or even higher, we have mice that can do remarkable things. Uh, we published last year that mice can run up to twice as far by raising their NAD levels back mm. to young. So 20-month-old mice were running like they were five months old again. <laughs> and that we traced to uh, improve blood flow through their muscles, which is something you usually only get if you exercise a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's pretty fascinating. And yeah, I, I've also seen some of your research that it's really effective in um, the, the mice, like just energy production and feeling more youthful and behaving like a young mice, mice would. Uh, but there are like different uh, types of boosting or different ways of boosting NAD, uh, like uh, nicotinamide, riboside and NMN. So can you walk us through all of the different types of them? Uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, people who sell these products. Uh, I want to say up front that I don't sell anything. I am not affiliated with any companies who sell products, even mm -hmm. though if you Google uh, these products, you'll see my name all over the place. So <laughs> if somebody says that I work with them or makes it look like I endorse them, it's, it's a lie. Uh, but I can tell you my scientific opinion. Uh, they, both molecules raise NAD, NR, and NMN. Um, I take NMN because uh, I have a supply of it in my basement because we, we made a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's more stable. Uh, NMN will last longer. Uh, NR is a bit more sensitive to to the uh, moisture in the air. Um, but mostly they're, they're equivalent. Now, we've done some experiments putting them head to head. We've seen that in endurance experiments, it looks like NMN performs better. Uh, but you know, it, I don't want to get caught up in this war, which is better. Right. I, I'm more interested in trying to understand what the biology is. Now, NMN is more expensive. This is one downside of NMN if you want to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm focused on is doing clinical trials with uh, different molecules that are hopefully better than either of those. And those clinical trials have been going on now for 18 months. And we know a lot about how much you need to dose people to raise their NAD levels up to about twofold normal levels. And we hope to do a, a phase two efficacy study in a disease next year called Friedrich's ataxia. And this would be I think the first, um, well, maybe not the, the first, but one of the first studies to, to test the efficacy. Um, the reason I paused is that there was a study that just came out looking at NR plus mm -hmm. teros terostilbene, which is like resveratrol. Um, and they saw some benefits in ALS patients, which what used to be Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm excited by some of these early studies that, are showing there might be some benefits in people, not just in mice. Right, right. So yeah, the, it's 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 a new field of research in the sense that we <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, experiments have to be done, and uh, probably it's a very contextual aspect as well that it may not work the same way in a young person versus an older person, and uh, the the way these molecules react will also be somewhat different. So are there like age differences uh, between people? Yeah, yeah, Sim, you've, you've hit, hit the nail on the head, is that when we treat young mice, there's no effect. And okay. that makes sense. They already have a lot of NAD. Now, if we exercise them as well, it seems to boost the effect of NMN. But generally, if you're looking for blood sugar lowering or other things, uh, it's the almost. And so that's why a disease like Friedrich's ataxia is something that I am optimistic about, because they have symptoms like old age, they have low NAD, we think, and low energy. Mm -hmm. um, and so the studies that are out there, uh, generally, I, if I was a scientist, I would try them on the elderly or diseases where energy is low. Right. Because, yeah, like uh, that, when energy starts to get low and a person that can't produce its own energy or the body can't produce its own energy, then it can't really fight disease either and it can't fight aging if, if there's like not enough energy so there's a like a fine line between having too much energy and uh, not being able to produce enough of it exactly and mo most of the studies so far have been on healthy individuals uh, some of them have been overweight but they're still healthy uh, i'm more excited about 
uh, people who really need an energy boost and may already have very low energy levels. So that's what we'll find out next year. Right, right. Looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, what would be some signs of like uh, aging that a person can look out for uh, when it comes to their physical, uh, you know, well-being? Yeah. Well, there are some some tests on age, uh, physical tests. How easily can you get up off the floor with your legs crossed? Uh, young people can get up in without touching the floor. Uh, I almost can. Sometimes I have to give myself a little push. An older person has to get on one knee. So this is a very simple test. It's not very accurate, but it's helpful. Mm -hmm. People can do it today if they want. Mm -hmm. uh, more accurate test is um, a blood test. Uh, companies like Inside Tracker, uh, which I, I have a small investment in, uh, just to disclose that. Inside Tracker tests uh, about 30 different biomarkers in blood and estimates your biological age and gives you recommendations. So I've been using that over the last 11 years and I can see how my body's getting older uh, over time. And uh, what I do is I look for things that make it apparently younger. Okay. And so I'm not blindly taking molecules or blindly doing exercises. I'm monitoring myself as part of a very small experiment. Um, and, but the, the more modern way of doing it, or at least the next generation of tests are blood tests that will test your epigenetic age. Mm. Uh, measuring the DNA methylation or chemicals on your DNA mm. that very accurately predict your biological age and when you will die. Mm. Uh, and that's okay. actually how we know in my lab whether we've made a mouse older or reversed the age of the mouse. Wow. That's cool. So like the DNA methylation uh, age, uh, is it w w like what's going to like affect this uh, age? Is it, is yeah. it like methylation or is it uh, just some other biomarkers? Well, methylation is the best epigenetic marker we have right now, though I'm sure there's others that we haven't discovered. Uh, but methylation, uh, many people will know, is just a chemical mark on the cytosine, the Cs of the ATCG. And we don't know why they accumulate. Um, we're working on that. And there's a big question in the field, are these methylations just a clock on the wall that represents biological time? Mm -hmm. Or if you change the clock, does time change? Okay. And most people, I think I'm probably the only exception, most people would say, it's just a clock. Don't worry about it. If you change the clock, you're not going to get younger. You're not going to get older. Mm -hmm. But we've just put out a paper online uh, on the website BioArchive, B-I-O-R-X-I-V. And if you look at that website and, and type in my name, you'll find it. It's, uh, it's already been downloaded about 7,000 times. Mm -hmm. What we showed is that if you can reset the clock and take off those methyls that have occurred over the last uh, year in the mouse, mm -hmm. you can actually reset not just the apparent age of the animal, but the biological age, their functional age. Wow. So when we do that in the eye of the mouse, we, we deliver a set of three genes and we turn them on with an antibiotic called doxycycline. And we don't just see the clock go back. We also see that the mice get their vision back. They can uh -huh. see again. Uh -huh. And those nerves are young again. They don't just look old, uh, look young. They are literally young. Uh -huh. uh, and so if we can restore vision in old mice, what else can we reverse? Wow. So you're saying that you can not only slow down aging, but you can actually reverse it and turn back the clock. <laughs> right. And that shows that the clock isn't just a, an indicator of the time. It is time. And if you right. move the hand backwards over there, Mm. you will actually turn back biological youth. And so it's extremely exciting now because we're now testing uh, whole body reprogramming, we call it. Um, and we're thinking that this could be a major breakthrough in aging research. And that instead of tackling each of those eight or nine hallmarks of aging, we might be able to turn them all backwards with a single treatment. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. And uh, yeah, it's the information theory is a very, you know, promising, at least, at least like, like what the initial research shows. Uh, what about, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your personal uh, exercise routine as well. Like how, you mentioned high intensity exercise. So how do you do it? And uh, like how often on what days? All right. Well, this is the part of my life where I'm not as good as I wish, uh, mainly because I'm working till midnight most nights okay. uh, except for Sunday. Uh, 
On a weekend, I spend three hours in the gym trying to make up for my lack of exercise during the week. Uh, so what do I do? So the biggest breakthrough was including my son, our son, in this reg- regimen. And mm-hmm. so I, I, do, I get to do two things simultaneously. Mm-hmm. I get to be a good parent and I get to exercise. So <laughs> that's the tip to all those parents out there. Yeah. Uh, I, I go to the gym a couple of times a week in our house. We have a little gym. But then the, the three hours is at a real gym where we spend an hour both weightlifting with a, with a trainer, very intense, um, all body, mostly the core, the back, the le- don't forget about the legs. The legs are very important, mm-hmm. um, especially if you have to write a book for two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, th- this book, I have it here. This, this almost killed me. Uh, <laughs> I sat down for two years and I didn't get up, basically. Awesome. But I, I'm, I'm now recovered. I can now walk again. I'm actually at a standing desk. It's going to be on that stand. So I, I don't sit down during the day. That's important. Um, at the gym, after that hour of weightlifting, we will then do uh, core exercises of uh, rolling on the ball and, and sit-ups that kind of make sure the core is there, holding uh, rubber bands to the side like this. Then we'll get on a treadmill and a stair master and just go until our breath is extreme. Uh, we'll do that for about half an hour. And uh, it's a mixture of rowing and uh, running and climbing. Mm. Uh, and then the rest of the time is a lot of fun and we go down to the sauna and get really hot we go to the steam room get really hot and then get it in the hot tub uh, relax mm. a bit and then do a cycle of hot tub cold hot tub cold and the cold is only four degrees mm. uh, i hate it it's really painful <laughs> uh, but we do it because afterwards we feel great and we think that it's activating also also to an uh, enzymes to protect the body mm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That the hot and cold are amazing, like uh, for the uh, FOXO proteins as well as autophagy and uh, AMPK and so on. So they're very powerful activators of these pathways. Yeah, actually, I've I've been doing a bit of an experiment on myself, looking at my blood sugar levels, and uh, so I recently, just a week ago, got a blood sugar monitor, mm-hmm. and so actually, just using my phone, um, I can test my blood sugar under here. Nice. Uh, let me show you uh, what, what it looks like. And when I go into the, the sauna, I'm, I think I'm losing my, so I'm, I'm now slightly lower than I want to be. Mm-hmm. That's, you can see the graph. So you're fasting at the moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, I haven't had any breakfast. That's my sleep and my breakfast. I've, all the red means uh, is good. Mm-hmm. But when, when I, if I'm full and I go into a sauna, I have to confirm this, but so far it looks like sauna is also bringing my blood sugar down, which would be pretty interesting. It would fit with the hormesis idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so as well, because of like the heat shock proteins and, uh, and such in- increased insulin sensitivity. But what about the cold? Some people say that their blood sugar rises when they get into the cold. Yeah, I didn't see that. Uh, it was pretty steady. I'm not sure if it goes down or up. It was, uh, I didn't have enough uh, N values to be able to be confirmed. Oh, sorry. Right. Over the next few weeks, I'll, I'll probably send out on social media some results, preliminary results. Mm. Um, needs more repeat, repeating. But mm. yeah, the cold, the cold is, uh, is going to have long-term benefits by boosting the amount of brown fat in the body, which mm-hmm. sits up here on the shoulders. And uh, that activates the sirtuin gene number three. And I, I think that probably the instant effects aren't going to be as apparent as the long-term ones. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So like managing your blood sugar and uh, staying insulin sensitive is also very important for anti-aging, right? Yeah. Your blood sugar levels is the best blood predictor of longevity, just based on, mm. you know, looking at thousands of people's longevity. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's thought that it's not just a, a clock of aging, but it also controls aging. And that's why the drug metformin is used by a a lot of people, myself included, to keep blood sugar levels under control. Hmm. How do you use it and how often? Uh, well, I've only been trying it for about two or three years. And it really came from work from out, out of uh, nearby Barzilai's lab mm-hmm. uh, and some other papers that studied more than 100,000 people now. And it turns out that diabetics, type 2 diabetics who take metformin, are less prone to disease than people who are not diabetic and don't take metformin. Wow. So what that says is that it's likely to be an anti-aging medicine. Mm. And you can see actually the risk of heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's and frailty goes down 
after taking metformin. And so I was convinced by the data, the risk is fairly low. You want to consult a doctor because it is a medicine, at least in this country um, and the English speaking world. Uh, but it's very safe and very cheap, relatively. Mm. Um, and so I decided to take it. And I think it's improved my overall health as a result. Mm. Yeah, yeah, like probably the reason has to do with suppressing insulin and IGF-1 and also uh, inhibiting mTOR because that's also like one of the longevity pathways. So uh, what, what can you tell us about mTOR and aging? Yeah, so mTOR is the third one that I haven't talked about. There are only three main pathways and they all talk to each other, right? So scientists mm -hmm. will argue whose pathway is more important. <laughs> um, it's really silly because they're all talking to each other. Right. mTOR is a really important one um, that's controlled by sirtuins. It's controlled by um, metformin, as you said. What also controls mTOR is how, mu how much meat foods you're eating. And there are certain amino acids that are more impactful than others. So branch chain amino acids, uh, these would be um, right. lysine, oh, sorry, leucine, isoleucine, for example. These are heavily concentrated in meat. Mm -hmm. um, that's one reason I don't eat steak every night. I try to eat more right. plant-based foods. Right. So low amino acids will act, uh, inhibit TOR, and TOR inhibition has been shown in animals and also in humans to have anti-aging effects. And it's actually the strongest way to extend lifespan in mice. Mm. And so for that reason, some people are trying rapamycin, which is a drug that in inhibits the immune system typically. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't do that because I, I think it's, it's got some toxic side effects that I'm not willing to take the risk. But there are some new molecules that are like rap, rapamycin. They're called rapamycin. We don't think will have the side effects. And those are really promising. But they're in clinical development still. Okay. Yeah, that, that's mTOR is yeah, like pretty important. It like regulates cell growth. And uh, there are studies showing that too much mTOR accelerates aging and uh, promotes cancer growth and so on. But at the same time, like too little mTOR is also somewhat bad because it can lead to like sarcopenia and uh, muscle wasting. So how do you find this sort of a sweet spot between uh, okay. getting like sufficient amounts of mTOR, but uh, not too much? Yeah, yeah. So as I, as I tweeted out last night in response to a new study that says meat is fine to eat, <laughs> Uh, what I said was, uh, the media goes back and forth. Every study, it's extreme. Don't eat meat, eat right. meat, don't eat meat, eat meat. The truth is that it's more about when you eat than what you eat. And so watch how much you eat uh, and mix it up. Don't eat too much of any one thing. Don't yeah. eat all fat. Don't eat all steak every night, <laughs> in my view. And more importantly, don't eat all the time. Uh, and actually, there are mouse studies that show that if you mix different ratios of protein, carbohydrate, um, fat, you get the same lifespan. Yeah. But what gives you lifespan extension is giving the mice those foods only in a short period. Yes. Yeah. The rest is hungry. Yeah. So if you believe those experiments will, will be too, true for humans, you can eat meat. Just don't eat it all the time. Don't have meat mm. in every meal. What do I do? I tend to eat a little bit of meat when I, I've been exercising because our body does need amino acids to build muscle. Mm -hmm. But on days where I'm not exercising heavily, um, I will actually take my metformin and uh, try to focus on plant foods. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree with you in the sense that people tend to go to the extremes and you can definitely just avoid all the negative side effects of all these extremes by trying to practice more balance. And like you said, just skipping a few meals and uh, restricting some of the protein is, is, is going to just give you most of the results in terms of uh, the uh, longevity. Like you're not going to overstimulate mTOR, but you know, if you are fasting, then you still want to make sure that you get enough of the mTOR and uh, the protein synthesis to maintain your muscle tissue. So in that sense, if you are practicing some form of time-restricted eating and fasting, which is like the critical part of the longevity increase, then uh, you don't have to be that kind of neurotic or that afraid of the animal protein because you're already getting most of the like sirtuins and autophagy activation from the fasting. Right. And, and you don't want to keep anything constant. Yeah. The idea of hormesis is to uh, have periods of recovery and growth and then stress, recovery and growth stress. And that's why you know, I'm not always in the sauna. I'm not always in the yeah. cold tub. <laughs> and I'm not always exercising, uh, you've got to 
change it up and keep your body in a state of high alert. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, so what, what's like the upper limit for human lifespan then? How far can we go? Yeah, well, there isn't any law that says this is how far we can go and no further. We do know that just naturally, genetically, evolutionarily, we can't get past about 120. Mm. 122 is the debated lo- longest life. But, uh, you know, that doesn't matter. It, it, what it proves to us is that from the average to the maximum, there's still 40 years to play with. Yeah. But can we have people living beyond that? Well, yes, I believe that's possible because just because we have a natural lifespan doesn't mean we have to stick with that. Mm-hmm. Nothing about our lives is natural. What about anything? Look around the room. What about anything yeah. in your environment is natural anymore? Maybe my desk is wood, but I don't even think that's real wood. <laughs> uh, so my, the argument, oh, we have a natural lifespan. Yeah, so what? Let, yeah. Let's work on that. Let's figure out why some species can live to 200 years. Whales, for example, who are very similar genetically to us. Mm-hmm. How do we stabilize our epigenome? How do we reverse epigenetic aging and get back the information that we've lost? And the good news is what we've discovered is that cells have a backup copy of a youthful epigenome that we can access using our mm-hmm. treatment. And, and that we didn't know that backup existed until just a year ago. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> uh, so everyone has like a ch- second chance. <laughs> well, maybe second, third, fourth, fifth. We don't know okay. yet how many times you can reset the age of a tissue. Wow. We've only done it once and it worked. Wow, we wanted to see if we can go 100 times, but yeah. maybe it only works once. We have to see. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah, like it's, it's, it's a, like uh, it's, it's a re- even, even like the best part is that uh, although you may be increasing the lifespan, you're also going to increase the health span, so to say, where, where most of the, let's say, happiness and uh, enjoyment comes from. If you're, if you're able to stay more youthful for longer. So imagine if people uh, got to still run and uh, walk the stairs and play with their dog at, the, at, at their 90s or something, then that's a huge improvement in terms of their happiness as well as like the general uh, success and productivity of the entire society. So yeah, like there's no real excuses not to do this research because it's just not, it's just going to move the uh, ma- humankind uh, forward. Yeah. So I use my, my father as an example of what life should be like for everybody. Um, and contrast that with his mother who at 80 was in a wheelchair mm-hmm. uh, or could not walk out of the house. She was not enjoying life. I don't blame her. That's what most 80-year-olds feel like, uh, or worse, actually. Uh, my father at 80 feels like he's 30. He's active. He started a new career. He just got back from Uganda where we visited uh, the gorillas, and he was hiking with his grandkids. That's the kind of life that I want for everybody. Mm-hmm. And when that happens, the world will not just be a happier place, but it'll be a more productive place as well, and a wiser one as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like wiser people tend to live longer, or they are already older. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. uh, but there are some downsides. You know, older people are more conservative politically. Um, not everybody's a nice person. You don't want a dictator <laughs> that's horrible living to 200. Uh, but we're talking about billions of people who are going to be old soon, not mm-hmm. just in the advanced world, developed world, but developing worlds are increasingly dying from age-related diseases. And so this work couldn't be more important. And yeah. my book, is designed to wake the world up because I think mm-hmm. the world is asleep about this matter. Yeah, yeah, it does a really good job at it, and uh, everyone who's listening, I definitely recommend uh, getting it. And it's a great overview of the science as well as the history, and even gives like uh, amazing uh, tips that people can do in their everyday life. So, what's what area of research are you most optimistic about, or like where should wh- wh- where do you think people should focus the most on? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I like senolytics, which are the drugs that delete senescent cells. When the DVD gets totally scratched up and the cell can't read the information, mm-hmm. we think that's what causes senescence and cells will check out of the cell cycle and cause inflammation. So that's interesting. But a lot of people are studying that now. Uh, I've been studying hormesis and molecules to activate the sirtuins for 20 years now. Mm-hmm. But actually now about a quarter to half my lab is working on reprogramming the epigenome and understanding not just why we age, why the clock turns over, but how to reverse it. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the most exciting fact that we can tap into that clock 
find out what's behind the clock and wind it backwards. Uh, and I don't blame everybody who comes to my lab who wants to work on this. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. Uh, well, David, it's been great talking with you and I'm definitely looking forward to more of these uh, research in the future. So before I ask my last question, uh, where can people learn more about you and your work and where can they get the book? Uh, well, my book is on sale at uh, most uh, electronic bookshop uh, book sales, you know, the usual Barnes & Noble and Amazon in America. Uh, it's published by Simon and Schuster in America and Harper Collins in Europe. It just came out in Germany yesterday, so yeah. you might be able to pick that copy up if you can read German. Um, I'm if you if you can't pick up a copy, let me know. Um, I'll find out a way to to get it to you. I can let you know when the translations are coming out. Uh, you can stay in touch with me also by going to a website, lifespanbook.com. There's a newsletter you can sign up for on that site. Um, and uh, all the time during the day, I'm, I'm on Twitter, I'm on uh, Instagram, putting out tips and interpreting the science that I read every day. Awesome. Sounds good. Uh, we're going to put all the links in the show notes. And uh, my last question is, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner that improved your body and your mind? Uh, eat less. I mean, honestly, it's eat less. I know it seems obvious. Um, if it, if I could have skipped two meals a day for my whole life, that would have been great. It's very <laughs> difficult. Right. I can't even go for a whole day without eating. I'm, I'm that much of a glutton. Right. <laughs> so I would do that. Uh, and I would do more exercise if I could, rather than just doing a little bit on the weekends. Mm. That yeah. would have helped. But I'm, I'm very glad that I started uh, on the supplements early in my life because I'm now 50 and I feel great. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. I've been doing also like fasting uh, since, since I was uh, in my, in my later high school years. So yeah, I've been doing it right. for quite a while. <laughs> well, do, can you disclose how old you are? I'm 25 at the moment. So I've been doing it for like seven years. Wow. All right. Um, well, you might break 120. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, I'll have to rely more on like maybe some other supplements in the future. <laughs> well, here's the thing to remember. Someone who lives longer will have access to better medical care. For sure. And we're making discoveries every year. And so it's a fact that the longer you live, the so more life you have. The exponential curve. You know. yeah. yeah. Well, right now we're going up linearly in, in lifespan. But these breakthroughs that we're making, they could easily make it exponential. And that would be... be uh, and amazing. what is life going to be like in the 22nd century it's pretty exciting to just even imagine being able yeah. to see that yeah totally totally we'll, we'll have to wait and see <laughs> well thanks for coming to the podcast and uh, really excited for the new research that you're going to publish so uh, we'll probably have to do another one uh, in a few months when we have like some new groundbreaking uh, discovery that sounds good we have three papers that are coming out in top journals over the next six months we think and uh We've, we've already received some feedback from the journal, so I'm optimistic that they'll come out soon. And, you know, I'll, I'll be letting people know on, uh, on the internet, but to be able to talk about them, uh, I would enjoy coming back on. Of course, of course, we'll have to set it up. So well, thanks for coming, and uh, I'll see you around. Thanks, Ian. I really appreciate it. All right, that's it for this episode of the Body, Mind and Power podcast. If you want to support us, then I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on iTunes and the other social media platforms. You can now order my new book, Metabolic Autophagy, that covers a lot of the same topics that we talked in here. It's a collection of certain lifestyle habits and practices that prioritize longevity as well as performance. To support this podcast, you can also become a Patreon and get exclusive video lectures from my biohacking bootcamp that covers circadian rhythms, intermittent fasting, autophagy, resistance training, biofeedback, and many more. But other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.